and welcome to the Religious Studies Project. It is Monday morning, which means that we have a new episode for you today. I'm Andy Alexander, and joining me today is... Sydney Castillo. Thanks so much for being here, Sydney. Thanks, Andy, for inviting me. It's great to have you back again. Can you tell us a little bit about the episode today, who you are talking to, and what our listeners can expect to hear? Most definitely. In this episode, I'm talking with Isvan Persel from Central European University, and he is going to discuss his research about Syrian Christians of Kerala during the early modern period in India. So this episode sheds light in one of the many religious groups that exist in India, and of which Professor Persel has discovered new sources related on their history in the early modern period, as I mentioned. These documents provide evidence on how pluralistic Indian society has been in what regards to religion, and how inherently diverse Christianity is by showing the particularities of the Syrian Christians. In this regard, it is worth highlighting the theological debates concerning Syrian Orthodox priest Mar Abraham and the Jesuit priest Francisco Ross, among others, which give an idea on how the Syrian Christians position themselves with their particular corpus of beliefs and practices with the arrival of Western powers, in this case Portugal. So in a nutshell, in this episode, you're going to learn about diversity of Christianity, how theological debates reflect particular sociological processes like colonization, and how archival research is done when discovering new sources. Also, as a bonus point, how to like kind of rewrite hi- historiography or generate a new historiography. So this is for this episode, Andy. Wonderful. That sounds fantastic. This is When Christians Meet Each Other, the St. Thomas Christians of Southwest India in the Early Modern Period, with It's von Purzel by you, Sydney Castillo. Take it away. And here we now I am sitting with Professor Isvan Purzel from Central European University. This is an uh, interview that has been recorded after the conference that we participated in at CEU in late November, titled Imperial Mysticisms. So we are happy to talk about this subject and the researcher from Israel Purcell during the interview. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me for this interview. Uh, now, uh, I will introduce you very briefly. Israel Purcell is professor of Byzantine and Eastern Christian Studies in the Department of Medieval Studies at Central European University Budapest, Hungary. He obtained his Candidato Scientia degree in 1995 at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He has extensively worked on late antique and patristic philosophy, and in the year 2000 he initiated the deitization and cataloging of the manuscripts collection of the St. Thomas Christians of Kerala. Welcome again to to the Early Studies Project. So, just to start or try to situate your research a little bit, I would like to ask you that you participated in the discovery of a corpus of source language manuscripts in Kerala. What does this encompass and how it sheds light on early Indian Christianity? Um, yeah, I participated, but I think I initiated it, basically, mm-hmm. uh, in the year, um, how to say, it started in 1998, mm-hmm. and I went for a conference in Kerala, and then they showed the conference participants uh, Syriac manuscript collections. Mm-hmm. That was a. I expected that such thing would be there, but then I saw them with my own eyes, mm-hmm. and then slowly, slowly, I built up a project for the digital preservation of these manuscripts. Mm-hmm. I made surveys uh, uh, of the conditions of the uh, of the archives and. Um, try to calculate how many manuscripts there can be before applying for research funds. And I had a conservative estimate Mm -hmm. of uh, around 1,000 little-known, unknown Syriac manuscripts in India. And uh, by now we have digitized over 1,200. And we don't know how many more there are. Mm -hmm. Now, somehow, this process has started because you have to be there Mm -hmm. to promote it. And now I am 
back to Hungary, and then to Vienna, teaching and whatever. Okay. Um, I had romantic ideas about the, uh, the, the stock of manuscripts that we would find there. As you asked, mm -hmm. I expected that there would be something with direct relevance for the late antique or medieval history of Christianity in India, mm -hmm. because, although few people know this, there has, there has been a Christian presence in India mm -hmm. since late antiquity. The legend says that it was the Apostle St. Thomas mm -hmm. who converted the, the first ancestors mm -hmm. of those who are called now Thomas Christians, or who are also called the Syrian Christians of India. They are also called Mappila Christians, mm -hmm. and this is the local term. Mapilla, mm -hmm. Mapilla, which means uh, um, the son of the maternal uncle, mm -hmm. which means the idea of bridegroom. Mm -hmm. So these were bridegroom Christians together with the bridegroom Jews and the bridegroom Muslims, Mapillas, because the community apparently was formed by an intermarriage between women belonging to local mm -hmm. matrilineal exogamous castes mm -hmm. and Western traders, travelers, sailors who came through the, uh, uh, by means of the monsoon winds mm -hmm. uh, through the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, in fact. So uh, whenever this first evangelization happened, it must have come on this road. Mm -hmm. um, the Roman sailors knew the cross Arabian Sea roads via the monsoon winds uh, from the beginning of the first century. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of documents about the trade interactions mm -hmm. between India and the Mediterranean in the first century. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not the apost an apostle has come, the only thing we can say is that it was not difficult mm -hmm. to get there. Right. But there is no direct evidence about an apostolic preaching in India. The first direct evidences are ambiguous, mm -hmm. and they are all coming from the West, nothing in India. Mm -hmm. What we discovered... Um, is mostly very interesting early modern and modern material. Mm -hmm. But within this, there is a strong historiographic material because these people were keen on writing and retelling their own history. And you have volumes and, uh, uh, and many texts retelling the history of the community mm -hmm. from, from the early modern times. And you also have Portuguese reports because they were also um, in contact with the local Christians when they came first in 1498. Mm -hmm. Vasco da Gama mm -hmm. arrived in um, Oricot, Calicut, in 1498. And in the year... Um, 1500, Pedro Álvarez Cabral mm. discovered the Christians mm. because Vasco da Gama didn't find them at the beginning. Mm. When he came back in 1502, then he encountered Christians. He was the second admiral, right. Portuguese admiral, to encounter Christians. The first was Pedro Álvarez Cabral. And... Um, um, and... Um, uh, so, we also have records, and these records are not very well mm -hmm. uh, processed yet, those Portuguese reports. A lot of them are in manuscripts in, in Lisbon mm -hmm. and uh, Goa mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Um, the first Syriac manuscripts that were written in India 
The first Syriac manuscript that was written in India is now in the Vatican Library, mm. and it was written in 1301. And it's a liturgical manuscript, but it has a very important colophon. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it even says where it was written, and it was written at, uh, in a town which the manuscript calls Shinjli uh, uh, or Shingli, mm -hmm. which we knew otherwise only from Jewish sources. Shingli mm -hmm. is a legendary Jewish city in India, mm -hmm. and apparently, wherever it was, we don't know mm -hmm. what this place means, in fact, um, there was um, a Jewish and a Christian community in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, but then the next Syriac manuscript from India dates to the 16th century, I think 1563. Mm -hmm. So we don't have old manuscripts. Right. We have we have local records, and the most important uh, local records, um, uh, which contain royal um, uh, documents, royal donations to Christian communities, are from the ninth century. Mm -hmm. The the famous column copper plates. Mm -hmm. The Kolam copper plates are the second oldest um, local documents because you don't have old documents there, and it's a um, uh, it's a <clears throat> grant letter written on copper plates and given to uh, a, a, a sanctuary. Mm -hmm called Tarisapalli, which is uh, apparently a Persian Malayalam hybrid word. Palli means sanctuary, mm -hmm. and Tarisa comes from Tarsa, early modern Persian Tarsa, meaning God, God fearer. Mm -hmm. So the sanctuary of the God fearers, and these God fearers, that was the Persian name for Christians. <laughs> so it's a, it's clearly, and also there is a leader of the Christian community who has a Christian name, um, Maruan Sapir Isho. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is the first local document. But it's late, it's 9th century. The rest is legends mm -hmm. and also histories. And it is possible to put history together but we have indirect sources, both from the West. From the, um, we have, earlier than the 6th century, we have very unclear documentation, mm -hmm. because we don't know what the India of the documents means. Yeah. Because India was called the place from where the spices come. Mm -hmm. Now, this means that from the Arab Peninsula to the Indian port cities, among which the most important was called Muziris, mm -hmm. coming from the Malayalam word Muchiri, that is to say, hair lip. Mm -hmm. But we have this in this Malayalam word, we have in the Greek documents in a Hellenized form, Muziris. Mm. But it's Muchiri. Mm -hmm. uh, mu is three, Muna, and Chiri is the lip. So mm, a lip with three <laughs> paths, that is to, because, because it was in the delta of the Peria River, mm -hmm. where it was separated into three uh, branches. Right. Okay, so, so we have documents, but those which we digitized, are only for this early history, they are only indirect witnesses. The most uh, useful, perhaps, are historiographic works, mm -hmm. which retell the history of the community from always beginning with St. Thomas. Yes. And then going uh, to contemporary times. We have such histories from the 
17th, 18th centuries. Right. Written in Syriac and in Malayalam. Specifically about that, I would like to ask you, like, how can we understand the Christian evangelization process or processes for that matter in Southwest India? Uh, were there any stages or you, is it possible to identify uh, absolutely. stages in this? Absolutely. Uh, th this, this uh, I have heard a lot on this mm -hmm. because for a long while, uh, so first I didn't know what to do with this relatively modern material. Mm -hmm. It's true that the oldest manuscripts that we digitized are from 1290 and 1291. Mm -hmm. But the, the oldest one, which is dated 1290, these are legal texts, mm -hmm. East Syriac and West Syriac normal canons. The East Syriac normal canon we have published in a facsimile edition, and the West Syriac is forthcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, but they arrived lately. The East Syriac normal canon, dated 1291, most probably arrived around 1560 mm. and something. So it must have been brewed by the last Persian metropolitan of the Christians there. Um, about the other one, which is the oldest manuscripts from there, mm -hmm. uh, the Nomo Canon of Barebroyo, the West Syriac Nomo Canon, we know uh, who was the West Syriac bishop, um, Mor Basilius Shukralla, mm -hmm. who brought it to Kerala in 1751. So it arrived there as late as the mid 18th century. Um, so, but what was written in India, with the exception of that only manuscript in the Vatican Library, mm -hmm. is early modern, beginning with the 16th century. Mm -hmm. and. And first, I, I was disappointed. Mm. I wanted to find the, the old things. Right. And they were not there. But then I understood several things which mm. are very useful for understanding. One, that the Syriac literacy that we encounter there is recent. Mm -hmm. And apparently, there was a long gap in contact with the mother churches. Mm -hmm. um, and eight years before Vasco da Gama discovered the way to India, mm -hmm. there was a delegation going to, um, <clears throat> uh, to Gazarta, the Beit Zabdai, where the uh, Nestorian patriarch, the East Syriac patriarch, was residing uh, in present-day Eastern Turkey. And uh, um, and uh, uh, they were, uh, after a long pause, when there were no, was nobody coming mm -hmm. from the Middle East to India, uh, so that there was no bishop, and there was no consecration of priests. Mm -hmm. According to the local histories, uh, they came to a situation when there remained only one consecrated deacon. Mm -hmm. and they forced that deacon to celebrate the Mass. Mm -hmm. And this deacon, whose name we know, he was called Joseph, went with two uh, companions of his who were laymen mm -hmm. uh, to Gazarta in 1490, asking for bishops. They were consecrated priests, well, no, two of them, reached out of the three because one died on the road. Mm -hmm. These were not very simple expeditions. Often the envoys died mm -hmm. and they brought bishops. And those bishops have renewed Syriac culture mm -hmm. in India eight years before the arrival of the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a famous story about the condemnation by the Portuguese of the local manuscripts, um, which were catalogued and censored by a very able Jesuit Syriacist mm -hmm. who was called Francisco Rose, a uh, Roche, a uh, uh, Catalonian Jesuit. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a synod 
condemning the heretical teachings found in these books mm. in 1599. But to my mind, those books which were then condemned were also recent. Uh, so they, they were brought to India in the 16th century by this renewed contact with the Persian church, right. with the East Syriac church. What was there before, we don't know. What we know, so, so sorry, I am responding to your questions sure. uh, 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 in a retroactive way, because this is also the, uh, the process of our work, yes. of reconstruction. Uh, we, we have first digitized material. This is early modern. We are cataloging them, reading them, trying to understand. And then we try to get back in time because what we knew until now was mostly local and European legends. Right. And what we try to establish on the basis of the documents is at least a probable historiography, mm -hmm. or even more documented historiography, but it's not easy. And what I understood, however, during this work was that Syriac was of limited help. I'm a Syriacist. Mm -hmm. This is why and how I went to India, mm -hmm. because uh, there were very few people who were dealing with the Indian uh, uh, Syriac mm -hmm. uh, material, the Indian and the Suryani mm. of India, that is to say the Syrian Christians, but this is again misleading, mm. because Suryani, Suryani is a Persian word, meaning uh, the Christians of the Persian Empire. And they were called Suryani because their liturgical language was Syriac. Mm -hmm. But these were Persian-speaking Christians. So the first trace, which is documentable, really, is the presence of Persian-speaking Christian uh, traders mm. who are coming and apparently intermarrying with local women. There are legends about this, very interesting legends as well. Legends also uh, contain very interesting historical information, but it's difficult to interpret them. Mm. Okay, so... There is a legend, no, I go the other way around, from yeah. the beginning. There is a legend about an apostolic mission. Um, the local tradition knows about St. Thomas Christians, uh, about St. Thomas evangelizing, but there is uh, a report from uh, Pantinos, the Alexandrian teacher, uh, uh, according to which it was the apostle Bertolomeu who went to India. But we don't know what this India is, mm. because there was also an, there was an outer India and an inner India. Outer India, that's the the area beginning with the Arab Peninsula. Mm. As India is the place from where the spices it's, come. Yeah. And inner India may mean India, right. but what this means precisely? That's difficult to know. Um, and um, uh, and. Um, uh, but then, from the 6th century onward, we have very reliable uh, information about the presence of Persian-speaking merchants. Mm -hmm. We have Cosmas Indicopestes, who wrote in Greek, and we have the Chronicle of Seert, um, which originally was written in Syriac, mm -hmm. but which we know in an Arab translation. And it contains valuable 6th century material about the presence of uh, Persian-speaking Christian traders in India, for whose sake mm -hmm. a certain bishop called Mana translated liturgical texts mm. from Syriac to Persian mm. so that they may use them or understand them in India. Wow. So the first documentable presence of that of Persian-speaking traders from the 6th century, Cosmas Indico Pleustes and um, the Chronicle of Seert. 
And then the first local document is this royal grant to the Tarisapalli uh, Golden Copper Plates or Tarisapalli Copper Plates dated 849, mm -hmm. which is clearly a royal grant letter given to a Christian community. Right. And interestingly, there are witnesses on the last copper plate testifying to the validity of the document mm -hmm. by apparently members of a trade guild, which is most probably the so-called Anjuvanam Trade Guild, the Trade Guild of the Foreigners, mm -hmm. where Manigramam seems to be the trade guild of the local traders. And um, uh, the signatures are in two languages, Arabic and uh, Middle Early Modern Persian. Mm -hmm. Uh, in three types of characters, in three types of characters, um, Kufic, mm -hmm. Arabic, uh, Pehlevi, and Hebrew. So first, Muslim um, traders testify to the validity of the document. Mm -hmm in Arabic, written in Kufi characters. Second, Christian traders writing in Persian, in Pehlevi characters. Third, Zoroastrian traders writing also in uh, early modern, middle or middle Persian, but early modern, uh, in Pehlevi characters. Mm. And fourth, Jewish traders writing in uh, um, uh, early Jewish Persian, early modern Jewish Persian, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Hebrew characters. Wow. So this is the, the first very um, strong document of the presence of all these trading communities. I have an idea because all, all people think um, that this was to validate the royal grant, right. but I don't think so. Um, this is this would even overestimate the role mm -hmm. of these trading guilds um, in the royal courts. Um, it seems to me that the document is a copy of the original, and it is the copy. Right. Which was testified to by the trade guild, by the members of the trade guild. Right. So we don't know the the, the precise the date of the copy mm -hmm. because there is the date which can be established to be eight hundred forty nine. Right. But that's the date of the original document of the mm -hmm. issuance of the original document. So this is a very important document, and uh, a two volume. Monograph. Mm -hmm. the, there was an international research uh, project on just the column plate, mm -hmm. and the two volume monograph is forthcoming. If I can still accomplish my duty, then I will uh, uh, give a text on the indirect text tradition of the column copper plates. Excellent. Um, uh, whereas the next, which is very important, is a similar grant mm -hmm. to Jewish traders. And then we have the Iravi Kortan copper plates, already I think it's uh, 13th century, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. uh, to, to apparently a Christian trader. Mm -hmm. um, we have other, all these are written in Old Malayalam, in local Dravidian script. Right. Um, and then we have, um, we have uh, um, very interesting um, uh, Tamil inscription from 1492, another royal grant. Right. So, we can establish that there was a certain formulaic identity 
between these royal grants from the 9th to the 15th century. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this shows how communities in port cities received privileges. Mm -hmm. These are This is our documentation. Besides this, we have very interesting legends, noted very early, either in these Malayalam or Syriac documents that we found, or by the Portuguese, who noted them uh, either translating something or rather through hearsay. Right. And uh, so what we can establish, however, is that it was these trade communities which received very important privileges. From whom? From the local rajas, the local kings. Right. And uh, um, whose presence was very important for securing the Trans-Arabian Sea trade. Mm. And um, unfortunately, the religious issues are not in these documents because these are purely legal documents. Oh, it's okay. only from the, the accompanying legends that we know that um, for these communities or with these communities, there came also bishops. Mm -hmm. There were there were two very famous bishops who are connected to uh, that community. So these two bishops were called uh, Mar Afrat mm -hmm. and Mar Shabur, and they were the saints of um, the community. Mm -hmm. They apparently came in the ninth century, and many churches were dedicated to them. Mm -hmm. Now, by that time, they belonged to the Church of the East, <laughs> which is also called Nestorian Church, and that was their affiliation until the Portuguese came. <laughs> and the first report on the arrival of the Portuguese is also written by those bishops who came not in 1490, but a little later in 15. 1502, 1503, who tell about their arrival mm -hmm. in Kananur, which is in northern, uh, the northern part of Kerala, where they met the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And they are retelling the story how the Portuguese came, how they got into battles with the Muslims, and so on and so on, how they were treated by the Portuguese, who were treating them very well. Mm -hmm. And they were very happy that there were some powerful Christians from the West. Mm. So for a while, there was a very good relationship between the local Christians and the Portuguese colonizers, because they saw in them allies, and they didn't also they had fierce competition with the Muslim traders, mm -hmm. and that helped the Christian traitors to have the upper hand. Mm -hmm. right. um, the, problem, the problem began with, uh, uh, with some hardening of the mission in the mid-16th century that was connected to the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was the idea that these heretical people, that these are heretics. Yes, and they have to be converted, or at least brought to obedience with the Roman Church. But in fact, um, uh, that last Persian metropolitan whom I mentioned, Mar Abraham, who came as an historian, was caught in 1558 by the Portuguese, and they forced him to sign a Roman Catholic confession. Mm. I found that, that confession, but I'm not sure whether it is that confession or that confession that he made later, right. confession of faith in Rome. The two must be quite similar, however, right. because then he became a, a Catholic bishop. Mm. Uh, but when they the, the poor, the, but they wanted to remove him, the Portuguese. Uh, they deported him. He escaped in Mozambique from the Portuguese ship mm. and learned that the patriarch who consecrated him, because all these bishops had lifelong 
obedience to the patriarch who consecrated them. Mm. But that patriarch died. And then he didn't go to the next Nestorian patriarch because by that time there was a schism already mm. within the Church of the East. One part of them in 1552 joined the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. They became the Chaldeans, mm -hmm. so called Chaldean Church. So he went to the Chaldean Patriarch, Mar Abdisho IV, who sent him to Rome. And then this Mar Abraham was reconsecrated, Metropolitan of India, by the Patriarch of Venice. Mm -hmm. And he was appointed by the Pope. So he came back as a Catholic bishop. Mm -hmm. And then began a long strife with the Portuguese, who had to accept his valid consecration in Rome, but who didn't like him and considered him an enemy. Mm. And he acted in an ambiguous way, one has to admit, because what he wanted was to keep the Syriac tradition. Right. So a very interesting interaction began, uh, and uh, his main enemy was this young Jesuit, mm. Francisco Rose, Rose, who was a brilliant seriousist. And so we have a lot of documents and information from this period, mm -hmm. because that was a time when the Kulturkampf, right. the cultural war, mm -hmm. was going on in Syriac, mm -hmm. which meant that a lot of Syriac literature was produced in India at that time. That was the place where more Syriac literature was produced mm. than anywhere else in the world in the 16th, 17th centuries. Mm. Is that uh, like the translations were coming from like source language to then Latin and then back and forth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was great translating activity and also mm. uh, uh, also original texts were produced. Mm -hmm. And all this was to make them good Tridentine Catholics. Oh. And they were resisting. And then they were playing the card of the Chaldean right. jurisdiction, which was also under rule. Right. Um, and that went on until that Synod in 15 provincial synod, uh, uh, no, diocesan synod. Uh, it was the province of Goa and the diocese of Malabar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, in 1599, the famous synod of Diamper, where their books, their customs, whatever was condemned to reduce them to a Tridentine obedience. Mm. And that didn't work very well. So that in 1653, there was a revolt. They appointed a local priest to be their metropolitan bishop. Mm. First, they wanted to be under the Chaldean jurisdiction. But then finally, in 1665, a Jacobite, that is West Syrian, Mm -hmm. Bishop came and consecrated this metropolitan mm -hmm. who was nominated by the laying of hands of, or consecrated by the laying of hands of 12 presbyters, mm -hmm. so-called uncanonically. And then there came about a split. Mm -hmm. Because part of the church followed this Martoma, mm -hmm. who became an independent metropolitan. And part of the church wanted to be under the Pope, mm. but they were also uh, kind of resilient. So that story went on during hundreds of years, and I can't go into the details. Right. But it's a very interesting story of Christian anti-colonial resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for this, we have absolutely new material. So whatever we found there sheds new light. And it's a fantastic story seeing it from the inside, from the, uh, from the uh, local sources, both in Syriac and in Malayalam. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and they come from secret archives, which mm-hmm. finally were open to us. So these are things that nobody has ever seen oh, wow. before. Um, and it was also a secret movement. And so there we have a lot to say, a lot of new things to say. Right. Now, you mentioned about the heretics and the whole this impulse from the church was trying to align the local uh, Christians into what is Tridentine trad- theology. I wanted to ask, related to that, that uh, what challenges did the mystical thought present in the manuscripts pose to the Jesuits and how they managed them? Okay. Um, it is a very interesting, at least for me, a very interesting issue that the uh, cultural war, so-called, yeah. between the Jesuits and the Middle Eastern uh, uh, Middle Eastern um, envoys or bishops, be they Nestorian, Chaldean, or Jacobite, uh, was going on not only in the liturg- on the liturgical and uh, juridical level, but also uh, at the spiritual level too. Right. Um, and we have a very important document by this aforementioned Francisco Rose, mm-hmm. who was the first really good Syriacist uh, on the part of the knowing Syriac, which was the liturgical and literary language of these Indian Christians, um, who, who knew this language well in a creative way. Mm. He was speaking and writing this language. Mm. And um, and uh, and was surrounded by other missionaries who also knew. Um, and, and he was apparently the first able to read the books. Mm. And he was scandalized because these were books of Nestorian theology. Right. And he found out that there were also mystical texts. Uh-huh. There's a fantastic book, The Life of Joseph Busnaya, um, which is extant in one manuscript mm-hmm. in the Vatican, but in a revised version. Mm-hmm. So some choirs are missing. Mm. And apparently those choirs contained that theology which Rose reading the book was scandalized with. Mm-hmm. So he, he wrote excerpts from this book containing the Nestorian theology, which had no, nowhere in the manuscript mm. in the Vatican. We know them only in the quotations of Rose. And he said that the book was brought to India by his older opponent, Mar Abraham, mm-hmm. the last Persian metropolitan, who even when he came back from Rome, was detained by the Portuguese in Goa for two years. Mm-hmm. And during those two years, he was revising that book. Mm. Now, what we found, however, in um, how many copies? In, uh, I think, three different copies. One is in Cambridge. One is in Trishul, and one is in Ernakula, mm-hmm. uh, are excerpts from the life of Joseph Busnaya by Johann Barcaldon, and uh, they contain the mystical teaching of that text, which is only partly present mm. in the Vatican manuscript. Right. Now, what is interesting is that that apparently, I don't know about the aim of, but perhaps also other uh, bishops were also introducing the mystical teaching of the Church of the East, but Mar Abraham definitely 
was mm. keen on introducing this. All right. And I can imagine that those excerpts are from Mar Abraham. Mm. Although it may be later as well. They are fantastic excerpts and and I have not yet I published a little bit of them, but the whole thing should be published. And and apparently Rose who himself had a mystical inclination, mm -hmm. took the challenge and started to translate uh, Western mystical material into Syriac mm. for countering this is Syriac right. uh, influence. Because apparently mysticism was also important for mm -hmm. these people. And so uh, he translated a lot, or, or his circle, Apparently, he translated a lot of uh, uh, Western spiritual literature, and apparently, the most uh, uh, their favorite author was Dionysius the Carthusian. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of Dionysius the Carthusian translated from Latin mm -hmm. into Syriac in India in the late 16th early 17th century. Wow. <laughs> but but I even found a hitherto unknown Syriac translation of Pseudo-Dionysus Therapagite's Mystical Theology. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a great discovery for the Dionysian studies. Uh, and I thought that I found the lowest translation by a certain seventh century, I think, translator Athanasius Ballad, verse 9. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So medieval translator, no, no, not seventh, uh, perhaps uh, ninth century translator mm -hmm. Athanasius Ballad. But then I showed it to the person whom we consider the greatest Syriacist in the world, Sebastian Brock. Mm -hmm. He went to the Bodleian Library opened the interlinear edition of the Latin translations of um, Pseudo-Dionysius and found out that they were based on the 15th century translation of Ambrogio Traversari. Mm -hmm. So it was not translated from the Greek into Syriac, but mm -hmm. from the Latin oh. of Ambrogio Traversari. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and now I attribute this translation either to Francisco Rose or his circle, because he was crazy about pseudo-Dionysius. Hmm. In all the writings we can discover, he's quoting Dionysius, he's um, using pseudo-Dionysius, even when he translates legal texts, mm -hmm. um, uh, it becomes very Dionysian. Mm -hmm. And Dionysius the Carthusian was also using out of pseudo-Dionysius, so pseudo-Dionysius became an inspiration for the Catholic mission in India. Wow. So that's also <laughs> an interesting issue. That's a very interesting combination as well, yeah. translation back and forth. And then there was another person, great missionary, uh, more Iovannis Hidayatala, who was a Jacobite, that is West Syriac, mm. uh, patriarchal, Envoy Legate, who became metropolitan of the in the Mar Toma faction, in the dissident faction. Um, uh, he arrived in 1685, was a great scholar, translated many texts, and he was introducing the uh, the, the, the the Jacobite teaching, including mystical text, like mm -hmm. the revelations of uh, Gregory the Illuminator, which oh. he translated from Arabic into classical Syriac in India <laughs> in 1689. <clears throat> so there was this cultural war which had to be conducted in Syria has produced an incredible literature mm. in Syriac by um, which which was enriched by East Syrian scholars, by local scholars. Mm. We found the poetic of a, 
a felúkon very gifted poet, Alexander the Indian or Kadavir Chandikat Tanár, mm. um, and also West Syriac mm. uh, missionaries. So it, 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 this uh, contributed to an unheard of blossoming of Syriac literature in India in the early modern times. Wow. That's, I think that's a very good idea for wrapping up. If you have any concluding remarks? Um, yes, only one mm. concluding remark. Um, what we uh, started was an exploitation and preservation not only digital, but also material preservation of manuscript archives of a basically a tiny community. Mm-hmm. Altogether, those St. Thomas Christians number 8 million, mm. uh, which is a small community in India. Mm-hmm. But you don't know what is lying there in the Indian archives. All right. Um, uh, what would be wonderful would be to do the same work with the Muslim archives. Mm. Where there are very many Arabic and Arabic Malayalam manuscripts, and we don't know what they contain. Oh. So apparently each community keeps its records, and we don't know what they contain. So it remains to be yet discovered and worked upon. Yes, yes. A a lot is to be discovered. Okay, you go to the Hill Palace Museum in Tripunitura, near Ernakulam, near Kochi, and you see there hundreds of stone monuments, inscribed stone monuments in the ancient Dravidian water script. Mm-hmm. There is not even a label, because nobody has read them. <laughs> but they have collected them, right. which is a good thing. But what they contain, what kind of history mm. is lying in these epigraphic documents? A lot of epigraphy has been done. There are excellent epigraphists in, in Kerala. No, Ragava Varier and uh, Keshavan Veluta are the leading experts, mm. and they are publishing wonderful things. Mm-hmm. But how much more is to be done? Yeah. In order to have, like, a complete historiography. Yeah. Uh, um, um, because in the history of India is normally written on the basis of colonial documents. Mm-hmm. But a different history can be written on the basis of the local documents. That's... And this is to be done. That's a very good takeaway. I think for now we will look forward to what you are going to get to be discovered and the publications that are coming up from your research. Hopefully. Thank you, Professor Ferser, for being with us here in the podcast. Thank you for uh, this interesting conversation and your kindness. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sydney, for that fantastic episode. And thanks to Dr. Perzel for joining us here at the RSP. And of course, a special thanks to you, our listeners, for sticking around for the episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode. So please head over to social media and let us know what you thought. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, be sure to head over to our website at religiousstudiesproject.com where you can find a transcript of this episode and more information about it. And of course, we greatly appreciate whatever support you can give us here at the RSP. We do our best to support the work of all of our contributors in any way that we can. So please consider heading to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash project RS to sign up for monthly donations as little as $1 a month or give us a one-time donation via PayPal. Also be sure to check out our Amazon affiliate links that are located on our website. You can use those when purchasing things on Amazon at 
no extra cost to you, but a small portion of your purchase will be donated to us here at the Religious Studies Project. And until next time, all that's left to say is thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR, and the IAHR, and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey, and founding editors Chris Cotter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver, and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews, Video editing by Alison Isidore, podcast transcription by Jaden Bartashius, and social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk, and .ca links, or donating at patreon.com backslash project rs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes, and all other portals. Thanks for listening.